Do I look okay? Or do I look like trash? Just like I thought. Just as I thought. Trash. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm Alexandra. And if you've stumbled upon this video, you probably love design just as much as I do. My channel is all about inspiring people to have a beautiful space, no matter how big, how small, if you rent, if you own, make sure you hit that subscribe button. We do tons of makeovers and it's always just like such a fun time here on Saturday mornings. In today's video, I am answering your biggest design dilemmas. I asked you guys over on Instagram to send your most pressing design questions. You came through, there's like 600 questions in my phone right now. I've just selected the ones that people ask the most often. I will say that I am by no means an expert. I didn't go to interior design school, but I have built a career around design and making over spaces. And I feel like I've learned a couple of tips and tricks along the way, just from doing this day in and day out. Carla, are you ready to learn some design stuff? Yay. So we're starting off strong. The first question is how to choose a white paint. This is probably one of the most overwhelming things when it comes to paint. There's like 8,000 million different white paint colors on the market. Which one do you go with? The first thing you wanna ask yourself is do you want your space to feel warm or more on the cool side? If you love modern design, clean lines, minimal amount of decor, you're probably going to be drawn towards a more cooler paint tone. These are white paints with blue undertones often or just like stark white paints. If you have a more like boho space, you want your space to feel warm and textured and layered, then you wanna go for a white paint with either gray undertones or yellow undertones. My go-to for a more warmer white with yellow undertones is Simply White by Benjamin Moore. I use it in just about every space. And the thing I love about this white paint color is that it's very white, like it's a pure white, but it's still warm. So there's nothing cool about this paint color and that's because it has yellow undertones. I use this color throughout my treehouse apartment which was very airy, very bright, but still felt really warm and cozy at the same time. Now in the middle, there are white paint colors with deeper yellow undertones. Really good example of this was Lindsay's bedroom. You'll notice that the color skews not yellow, but like a buttery kind of white. So this is a color that you want to go for if you don't want a pure white, but you really want something that's warm, but still neutral. A really common color that I actually haven't used, but a lot of decorators use for that more pure stark white is Chantilly Lace by Benjamin Moore. This is a really popular paint color among decorators and designers because it's a pure white and it's used often on ceilings and trim. I guess it says a lot about my design choices because like I can't think of a space where we've used a stark white before. So I'm often drawn to those more like warm kind of buttery whites. Sticking within the world of color and how to pick colors, someone asked, how do I put together color schemes? When I started in the world of design, doing this job, this career, I was terrified of paint because there's just so many to choose from. And I felt like I definitely have to be some sort of expert in order to like be entitled to paint my wall a color. I know, it's weird. One of the things that I find most helpful is starting with one piece of furniture or decor. That could be anything. That could be like a vase you really love, a rug you love, a piece of art you love. You just wanna slowly pull out colors from pieces that you either already have or want to buy. And this is where mood boarding comes in really handy. Start with one color, pick a color that you think complements that within another piece of decor and just start experimenting. On Pinterest, if you type in color schemes or color scheme ideas, there are tons of people who have kind of made existing color templates. A lot of the time it's graphic designers that create color templates for websites, but you could totally use this as a jumping off point. Speaking of mood boards and color planning, Milanote is a tool that I've told you guys many times about, and I know that so many of you now use it. Milanote actually has a color scheme tool built into it, which is so cool. So it takes the colors that are already in your mood board and finds colors that match perfectly that are actual paint colors. So that's like a built-in tool for you. You don't have to do any of the hard work. Okay, 
Next question. I actually got this question a lot or like questions that were similar to this one. Any advice for someone stuck in design paralysis? Just can't start my kid's bedroom refresh. I think that this is such a common feeling because even though inspiration nowadays is like never ending, it almost makes it that much more overwhelming to start a project. There's like too much inspiration in the world. I totally get it. I'm like, what if I just run out of ideas? That's not gonna happen to you or me. It's all about how you approach the inspiration that you've collected. Whenever I'm making over someone's space, I always ask the person for just three inspo images. Before, when I would say, send me a Pinterest board or you know, send me a selection of images as like a jumping off point, people would send me 15 to 20 images and they would all be totally different styles. It was like they just pinned a bunch of things, handed me over the board and I was like, wait, I have no idea what your style is. So when I ask people to pin three images, I want those images to be like a perfect reflection of spaces they're really drawn to. And even if those designs are completely different within those three images, there are always gonna be similarities woven through those three images that I can pick out and run with. Pick three images that you really really love and start bringing in a collection of pieces that you really love. I think that starting with three inspo images, even if that's not the style or design you end up with, is just a really great way to get those like creative juices flowing. Whenever I'm feeling a bit stumped, I always just take a browse through Pinterest or my magazines that I've collected over the years and I don't know, I always just feel like inspired by something. Another thing I do is whenever I really love a space on Instagram, when it comes up on my feed, I save it. And I have a rule, I only save interiors that like make me feel something. Like it's not just like, oh yeah, I like that, or like, oh, it's okay. It's like, oh, I love this space. So I always save it. And when I'm feeling kind of stuck, I go into my saved page on Instagram and I just take a browse through. And there's always similarities. It's like, oh, right now I'm really loving green or I keep saving this kind of tile. And you'll notice once you look back at the things you've pinned or saved on Instagram, that there's always a consistent kind of thread throughout the things that you're drawn to. The next question is kind of similar. How do I find my aesthetic? Again, like there's so many styles out there, but one thing I've learned is to try to not box myself into just one style. Even now when people ask me, what is your design style? I do this for a living, I should know. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I love boho, pastel Scandi spaces. I would just recommend buy things that you love. It's the way you're gonna have the most eclectic kind of you feeling space. Once you start buying things that you really like, you'll slowly start to be like, oh, I'm like a mix of boho and eclectic and modern and whatever. And those are the spaces I'm always really drawn to, the spaces that feel just really personal to that person. There's lots of quizzes you can take online that will tell you what your design style is. I'll link some of those down below, but buy what you love. You know? Get in, loser. We're going shopping. We're talking about rugs next. So boring. <laughs> rugs really, I don't know, stress me out. They need to be the right size. They need to be the right color. They need to look good. When the rug doesn't like, isn't straight, like it just like makes me feel funny inside. I'm like, I can't, I can't go on. Rug time. Everybody brace yourself. <laughs> Carla, I have to change the rug. I'm gonna bring both rugs home. Fast forward to 4 p.m. and it's a completely different rug. <laughs> So the next question is, what kind of rug should I put under my dining table, if any rug at all? Also, what size? Great question. You always want to buy a bigger rug than you think you'll need, and you always want to measure. The rule when it comes to the size of rugs in a living room or a bedroom, similar, obviously this depends space to space, how big your space is, how small your space is. But generally the rule is that the front two legs of your sofa should sit on top of the rug. Similarly, in a bedroom, the rug can either go right up against the back wall, so your nightstand sit on top of it, or it should be put two thirds the way down of your bed so that the front legs are sitting on the rug and your night tables are sitting on the floor. In a living room, when you have a conversation area, your chair shouldn't be hanging off the rug. Like everything should fit on the rug and the pieces should have a little bit of space to like breathe. If you have a rug that's too small in a space, your space is gonna feel unfinished. It's gonna feel disjointed. It's gonna feel really small. Just as I thought. Trash. In a dining room, you also wanna make sure you are using a large rug. So you wanna make sure your dining table sits on top of the rug and you wanna make sure your chairs also sit on top of the rug. You don't want it like <laughs> kind of falling off the back. 
In terms of styles, I always think something really easy to clean. So like, don't put a shag rug under a dining table. <laughs> think of jute materials, washable rugs. There's a company called Ruggable that makes washable rugs, which is awesome. Anything that's just easy to clean and isn't going to trap all those crumbs of food. Next question, how to decide which wall makes the best accent wall for a bedroom? You guys, these are all such great questions. You will know what wall should be an accent wall because it should be the wall that you see right when you walk into a space. I feel like it's kind of almost a waste if an accent wall is hidden. You wanna be able to walk into a room and see a beautiful pop of color. So that's always the rule I kind of try to follow. Accent walls are also great to frame certain areas in your home, especially if you live in a small condo or like small apartment that's all open. Behind a bed is great to kind of like frame the bed area. Behind a television and a media unit. In a studio apartment, when you wanted to find a space, using paint as an accent is really great. Basically, just anywhere where you want to visually divide space or highlight an area. So this is a question I get asked all the time. How to incorporate a partner's taste, moving in together, if you have the stronger design. This was one of the biggest challenges I faced when I moved in with my partner Noah. What if one person loves pink, boho, bright and airy spaces, and the other person loves more like dark, moody, industrial spaces? I'm describing myself and Noah. <laughs> this was super challenging for us because our styles seemed so polar opposite to each other. So one thing that we did that really helped us is we sat down together and we said, okay, what are the non-negotiables? What colors are off the table? What colors do you feel really strongly about incorporating into the space? And for Noah, he was like, I just want touches of, you know, darkness in my space to make it feel like mine. And I was like, okay, but I really want like bright and airy tones. And we kind of like met in the middle and compromised. So for me, I was like, I need a pink sofa. I actually m may have cried about it. Really? <laughs> yeah, I did. And he was like, wow, a pink sofa seems really important to you. I was feeling sad about saying goodbye to the treehouse, but I was also really excited about moving into our new place. And so for me bringing, I don't know, part of my identity with me felt like I needed to have a pink sofa. But then we mixed in other like darker elements. So the bench, I stained black. I carried that in through the picture frames on the ledge into some of the throw cushions on the sofa. And together Noah and I found that actually merging our styles pushed us both out of our comfort zones. In the bedroom, we decided to make it a really like neutral design palette so that it didn't feel like one person's space over the other. But then in Noah's office, we really leaned into like his dark, moody, industrial style and that's his space. So I think it's all just about compromise, but don't be afraid to mix styles, especially when they're on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. I feel like our house is so unique and such a blend of both of our styles because we embraced it. It took a lot of trial and error. Those of you who have been around, know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Got a few questions about styling a living space if you have pets. I could do a whole video on pet decor. I feel like we've done many of those. I'll link them. Decorating with a pet can be challenging, but also really fun. I feel like there's so many companies now that make beautiful pet beds, beautiful pet accessories. There's like no shortage of pet furniture for home decor lovers. I think the key if you live in a small space is to make sure that everything counts. So your cat's bed should be fun and beautiful because it's out on display. Your cat scratcher, there's so many cool cat products like cat scratchers that are actually really aesthetically pleasing. There's also a lot of furniture on the market like side tables, or even media consoles that double as cat beds. So again, if you live in a small space and don't have room for a media console and a pet bed, you can combine it into one. I've also really leaned into DIYs when it comes to decorating my space. So Lottie's litter box is in this cabinet, it's hidden. I did one in the treehouse and I also did one in my new place. Just finding ways to like hide your cat's accessories <laughs> is always a win. Same goes for dogs. I always talk about cats because like I've never had a dog. I'm, I'm a cat person. There are beautiful dog beds. There's beautiful dog bowls you can get. I always really like looking at local ceramic artists who make pet bowls. Your pet supplies should also be beautiful. That's how I like to think. A big thing about decorating with pets is figuring out what fabric you're gonna buy for your sofa or your living room furniture. The best fabric if you have a pet dog, cat, whatever it is, is microfiber. Microfiber is really easy to clean, really easy to wash. The hair of your pet doesn't cling to it as easily. 
The thing about microfiber furniture is that being totally honest, it's not always the most like stylish. It doesn't always look the greatest, but it is the most functional. There's differing opinions out there, but one thing I've found really helpful with having a cat is having a velvet sofa because the weave in velvet fabric is really tight. So there's no like little threads for Lottie to pull on or pull out of the sofa. Whereas when I lived with Marty the cat, he destroyed, destroyed the sofa because at the time it was a really loose weave. There were so many threads he could pull out and there was like, no going back. Once he started pulling those threads out, it was like you couldn't save the sofa. I've never had a problem with velvet with my cat. Lottie sometimes scratches, but if you find that you have a cat that is pulling threads out of a velvet sofa, use a fabric shaver to just shave down the threads that they've pulled out. If you've invested in a really expensive sofa and you're finding that your pet is just destroying it, you can buy these like plastic covers that stick onto the side of your sofa that will protect it. The trade-off for this is that velvet does attract pet hair. If you buy a really Really good quality velvet. It's gonna be a higher price point. I find that it's way easier to just clean with a lint roller, but I bought really cheap velvet cushions and I've had to get rid of them because the hair just clings to it. So there's pros and cons, I guess, to each of those fabrics, but for me, velvet always has been the easiest to clean and the easiest to maintain having a cat. I really hope that I was able to answer some of the questions you guys had. Let me know if you like this kind of video, if you like the more kind of tip-based educational design videos. And as always, I will see you guys next time. Bye.